So um, our next speaker is Dr. Oliveira Markovic, and I, I, I'm kind of a uh, I don't know where to begin to um, to start introducing her because she's done so much in her in her um, in her career. But she is a renowned cancer research scientist um, and university medical school professor. She's also the founder and president of the Global Academy for Women's Health and the author of the book What Every Woman Should Know About Cervical Cancer. So this is a perfect segue to start talking about cervical cancer, the past, present, and future. So, Dr. Markovich. Good afternoon, everybody. And uh, I'm glad that we are refreshed a little bit now for a couple of minutes and ready to hear about another horrible disease that we all would like to fight and to conquer. And uh, I'm going to talk about cervical cancer, another, another bad fatal disease that is uh, disturbing and frightening and women all over the globe. And uh, I'll tell you a little bit history about this. Four months ago, Dr. Amin and, and uh, yes, you and me, and uh, the worldwide health systems asked me also, you uh, asked me to, to come and to talk about this. And I took this commitment, and now when the, car, the time came, I said, well, I'm coming. And during these four months, we were working together. We were working with, with the rural health system and with Dr. Amin to identify the needs for prevention of this fatal disease among Egyptian women. Because we had this meeting today, we wanted to, to, to work on, on this subject and, and build a foundation on which Egyptian healthcare providers and policy makers will develop a strategy to fight cervical cancer in Egypt and to help the well-being of Egyptian women. Uh, we did our own research, but also uh, Dr. Amin provided us with most recent information about, the, about cervical cancer in Egypt. <coughs> and this lecture today is aimed to give you an overview of, of past and present and future cervical cancer, but most importantly, to focus on the possibility for a new healthcare strategy, on an organized fight against cervical cancer in Egypt, an outstanding opportunity which Egyptian, Egyptian government and healthcare providers can use to improve the well-being of their new uh, population. And uh, I may have the next slide. Yes, and the Global Academy. And just one minute with the Global Academy. The previous global academy. Yes, but the global academy, the first side. Yes, okay, okay. Can you hear me in the back, gentlemen and ladies? Or should I focus like this? Yes. Okay, okay thank you. I'll try thank to, to do this. Okay, so uh, why we? Uh, I'm founder and president of the Global Academy for Women's Health. And uh, this organization is located in John Hopkins University, Montgomery County campus, and has a mission to advance science and education in women's health. Uh, the, the, the Academy, the Global Academy, is particularly focused and devoted to women's malignancies to women's malignant diseases and because thousands of women die and millions 
are afraid of getting ultimately fatal disease that could easily be prevented. And that will be my message to all of you today, to try to prevent the great disease and spare precious lives. Uh, doing so, the Global Academy of Women's Health is supporting, is motivating companies to develop uh, simple, inexpensive, uh, low-cost medical diagnostic devices that can be used in every corner of this globe. And uh, as you can see, the, our emblem is that women of all races are, are holding the globe and help women, regardless where they live. Everybody has the right to a decent health care. And we hope that we, doing so, can alleviate the disparity between uh, developed and developing country in female health, the women's health, that, as we all know, exists today. I have the next slide. <coughs> Uh, cervical cancer is malignant disease which affects the cervix, the colon of the uterus. It is called cervical cancer disease, cancer of the colon of the uterus. And <clears throat> the disease and unstoppable growth of malignant cells which destroy tissue around the lesion, spread to lymph nodes and metastasize around the body. Uh, if this natural history is not inter interrupted by preventive and curative me measures, the outcome is ultimately fatal with few years of the detection of the first symptoms. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, can you hear me now in the back? Yes. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Now, just one little overview of the disease. The first uh, uh, image on the left just shows the the, the cervix, frontal view of the cervix. Okay, I have now, yes. This is the frontal view of the cervix, and this uh, rose, uh, light purple zone, is called transitional zone. And this is the most susceptible place, location, where the cervical cancer is developed. This is between two different epithelium from the from the from the internal, I mean the cervical canal, and the other vaginal epithelium. And in this transitional zone, uh, infection and trauma uh, really easily uh, develops into something that we don't want to see there. So, location of the for the cervical cancer, and then. Uh, lesion starts to to the lesion starts to 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 appear. And you see this small lesion there? This is the beginning. And if in this beginning by screening uh, the, the women which may not have any symptoms, uh, this lesion can be detected the woman, the woman is cured. She is a subject of small surgical intervention in, this, in the afternoon, and she goes home and continues with, with her life. And this is the importance and the meaning of screening to detect cancer earlier, even in the pre-cancer stage, and to save women's life. One afternoon, one week, instead of a lot of money, chemotherapy, we heard about chemotherapy, and, and ultimately uh, that. What we can see on the third, on the third slide, on the third here, on the third slide, and uh, you can see here, on the third slide, advanced inoperable diagnosis uh, when the cancer spread. And for this disease, it is a bad disease. I mean, it is uh, a bad, it is latent disease. In the beginning, women do not have any symptoms. And this is why it is important. And I would like to pass really this message. It is important 
to have this regular screening to catch the changes before they become cancer. Because it is very, very, very bad disease, very mean disease. It doesn't show up until it is already late. Okay, let's have the next slide, please. And what is happening then? Then the doctor takes a little piece of the specimen or a smear and, and, and put it on the microscope and look on those things. And <coughs> doctors finish medical school, then finish specialization in pathology, eventually in the cytopathology, and they diagnose, they can say by the shape of those cells, and there are about 80 parameters. Are there some suspicious cells that must be removed? And this is the only way when a surgeon can operate safely, having this cytological or histological microscopic result. Then you have the next slide, please. And uh, when, when the disease starts to, start to advance, we have in the beginning, we have this, uh, we call this carcinoma in situ. It means that it is still confined to its space, is not spread. And in this situation, it is again possible to, to intervene with different surgical procedures. I don't want to go into details here. And, but it is curable, still curable. You see the importance is of as early as possible detection. And then stage 1A, when diagnostic intervention, like surgery, surgery maybe plus local radiation, but still it is curable. And then later we only can hope for improvement, not for cure, with all different modali modalities, local surgery, uh, radi radical surgery, radiation, chemotherapy, combination chemotherapy, and alternative therapies. Yes, and I have the next slide. Again, cervical cancer is preventable if detected, prevent, pre preventable and curable if, if detected on time. And uh, uh, women in developed countries are well protected with regular screening and early removal of suspect lesions and cytological screening. So as we all know, known as pap test, is, remains the best cervical cancer prevention. And you know here, all of you, I know you go and have this exam to, to make sure that you are okay. Now, I would like to tell you a little bit about epidemiology. This is what we are doing lately. Uh, here is the standard uh, of uh, USA, let's say, take USA, and then the world, and then Egypt. Because of, of introduction of pap tests in the middle of 19th century, and, and the promotion of this test by, uh, by the National Cancer Society, 80% uh, today, 85% today of women go and have their regular uh, cervical cancer screening. And this is blessing, I mean, because thousands and thousands of women that died before pap tests became reality in this country are now reduced to, as you can see, 12,000 women today in the United States get cervical cancer and only 4,000 women die. It is more than 80% decrease of mortality. It's a huge success. But in the United States and developed countries, uh, in the world, uh, as we see here, outreach is 80%. In the world, is only 20% and less than 20%. 
I can tell you we work in India, for example, it is 6% of outreach. And outreach, I mean how many women have their regular screening, preventive screening. In India, 6%. And if you have an average of developing and developing country, this is less than 20%. It means that only 20% women go to, to have this life-saving test, and 80% are left behind. And this is why in the world today about 600,000 women get cervical cancer per year, 600,000. And, and 360 approximately die. Every, every three minutes, uh, every three minutes, one woman, uh, every three minutes, one woman die from cervical cancer in the world, and every two minutes get cervical cancer. But every three minutes, one woman die. Because prevention is not still accessible and available to the whole world. This is what, what is our devotion to try at least to alleviate the disparity. And what is happening in, in Egypt? Uh, this is what we found. We found that there are 28 million women at risk. And we couldn't find exactly data how much is the outreach and diagnosis. And we found that only 514 uh, get cervical cancer and only about 300 women die per year. It doesn't seem quite correct. Uh, cervical cancer is democratic disease. It doesn't, doesn't <laughs> recognize, doesn't recognize borders or or color, or religion, or, or, or other, other things. Every woman is uh, susceptible to this disease. But maybe awareness of cervical cancer should be increased among everybody, among professionals, about public, about uh, policy makers, and statistics and registration of those cases cases should be improved. So we will have a little bit uh, more realistic uh, picture of what's going on in order to help, in order to improve this. You know, we have to start from something in order to improve this and help people. Okay, we well, have the next. And I would like just to make this comparison between the USA and Egypt. In 1950, when the TAP test was introduced, uh, it was, uh, with, with years, it, it became, uh, the, the outreach became about 80% reduction. And at present, we have here in the United States, we have pub tests, we have different uh, varieties, uh, liquid-based pub, for example, then we have HPV testing, then we have HPV vaccination, we have some DNA testing, and also there is another method that is rather well known in the developing world. It's called VIA. Uh, it is visual inspection of the cervix and nurses are going with those uh, mobile clinic cars and and explain the cervix, put something like vinegar, some acidic acid. There is a change there if there is something on the cervix and they immediately treat this with cryoablation with cold, you know and remove this part. Well, there are a lot of concerns about this. It helps, I mean, it is used, but there are concerns because uh, the treatment is done without diagnosis. It can be precancer, it can be something else, just inflammation, it can be cancer, and, and at such an aggressive uh, treatment may sometimes, uh, I mean, more har harm than help. And also the tiny uh, cervical canal, uh, because of scarring, can not be, I mean, 
It can, it can, can be harmful, and women can suffer of infertility. So there is always some, some good and bad side of, of the things. And uh, today and the future should be practically to use all the experience that Papdes has given to us in 50 years, practically saving so many women's lives to, to learn on that and to improve this and make it available and accessible for, for the world. And <clears throat> therapy is still obsolete, and the pap situation, the disease is not recognized as serious uh, pending problem, and needs better diagnosis, better prevention of risk factors, and cancer control and screening. Can I have the next slide? And I just wanted to summarize about pap testing in, in the in United States before pap test in the first half of the 20th century that almost no organized cervical cancer control and screening and the rates for cervical cancer prevalence and mortality were increasing steadily. In the middle of the century, the test was promoted by the American Cancer Society and then from less of 5% was raised to more than 80% with parallel, parallel decrease in mortality for the same 80%, so 80% decrease of the, of the mortality. Today, there are about 50 million pap tests done each year in this country, and cervical cancer prevalence and mortality decreased below the red line of the most frequent diseases in the US. We made surveys here in Washington metro area, and those small number of 4,000 which die, oh, either they have had a negative pap or they didn't go to have pap test. Highly educated women, for example, from universities, they do not go because they don't want to know what's going on. We have such, 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 I mean, it's all, so there are different things, and we have to try to alleviate and to help in all different ways. <coughs> I would like just to show you something. What's happening in the world, I mean, in order to better recognize the situation in Egypt. Uh, we work with India, we work with China, and here you can see, just a moment, okay. You can see the outreach, I'm only, I'm talking and I'm really emphasizing outreach. Outreach is, is, uh, is uh, uh, blue. If outreach is high, mortality and morbidity is low. This is the United States. In India, Less than 6% outreach. 94% of women do not have preventive screening. And this is why in India there are 73,000 women dying per year. And this, this number is increasing. It is, uh, it is now, it is now uh, expected that if nothing will be done, in 2025 there will be this number. China is a little bit better situation. The government really uh, pressed the, the, the needs and they included yearly cervical cancer screening in their program. So the situation is improving in China. Yeah, have the next slide. And this is our, our strategy for India. We work with India. And when it is known and we know that when the outreach, I mean that the number of women who go for cervical cancer screening reaches 50%, then the trend starts to decrease. At 50%, the number of deaths and the number of, of diseased women start to go down. And this is the, the aim of the strategy, to increase, to increase the outreach, to have more women participate in preventive screening. So, Egypt needs strategy for fight against cervical cancer. How? To improve awareness to, through professional education and school education, and to reduce risks, and to, to promote screening for early lesions and removal. But nothing can be done without tools. How to do this? You know? It is easy to say, but we need tools in order to approach those goals. 
And as I said, uh, learning from the decades of good experience in PAP test, uh, Global Academy of, for Women's Health advised one of our companies by second to upgrade the PAP test and to make it available and affordable for the whole world. How? Not to wait these 50 years that US was, was needed to come to this point, but in this situation today, uh, 20, the 21st century is the time of, of IT technology, IT programs, telemedicine. Telemedicine is a huge, huge advance. It means we do not move patients now from the point of care to the center. We can move images, X-ray images, ultrasound images, EKG. We can move microscopic images and have the diagnosis even, even we do not have uh, professionals at the point of care. And one huge field where we are re very much engaged lately is so-called M-Health, mobile health. You can use a cell phone and you can transmit the image. I feel bad because I cannot see my moderator here. And we can use cell phone and we can instantly transmit images from the microscope to the center, get the result within half an hour and make the decision by the recommendation what to do. And this is one thing, this is e-connection. E-connection, I'm talking still about e-connection here. And I mean, telemedicine is one power. How we can empower the pap test to make it accessible and equitable and, and available to people. The second thing is, the second advan advance in, in medicine is in, in biotechnology. There is huge advance in bi biotechnological methods. This is nanotechnology. It is huge discovery field of, of biomarkers that are helping us together with telemedicine to, to pass faster all this period of 50 years that the US needed to come to this point. And uh, just, just one. And the third is, you know, how we can, how we can increase the, the outreach. Many women, and you know this uh, better, I mean, of, of, from, you know this very well, that many women in this world have some tradition constraints, some religious barriers. They are not so much comfortable to go to gynecologists. And even here, they are everywhere. Women just don't like to go to, to, to have this exam. To enable women who either because of some, some tradition cannot, do not, put, do not like to go to gynecologists, or maybe there is no access where to go to the doctor. For those women, uh, some way should be done to, to have a possibility to take the sample at home and to send it for, for testing, you know? It is possible to have a, a test at home and to send it. This is tremendously, I believe, increase the, 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 the outreach. And uh, what is the third part here is uh, a small, so we, we have, there is a kit here, you see, a small kit that can be sold in, in uh, drug stores and we can use and the same material and also to supply small laboratories in villages with uh, means that, that uh, uh, a low trained technician can process the specimen. And specimen cuts, a low trained technician to be able to process the specimen, and the same person just to send the image and to get the result. These three ways are how we can increase the outreach much faster, giving possibility to women who do not have access, who do not want to go to gynecologists to have their material taken home, to to empower those small laboratories, doctor's offices, to do the test. So there will be many places where the test can be done. And, and telemedicine, what is very important. 
And next. And this is this technology that we called MarkPub platform technology that BioCycle is introducing and working on this for more than 10 years. And the material, how it looks in reality, the material is from a woman, male or, or, or coming to the doctor, is coming to the lab. No trained technician is examining, uh, is staining the processing the slide, and then just put the the, the, the slide on the microscope, send it, and receive the result, and, and suggest what should be done. And so this is biomarker-based, telemedicine, empower, telemedicine empowered, equitable, infrastructure independent uh, approach to help women regardless where they live. And the last slide. And so expected results, of, future of, of in Egypt, what we think is again awareness. Increase awareness among professionals, policy makers, insurance, and public. Increase up to 50% of the women that risk uh, outreach uh, within the next 10 to 50, 15 years. And reverse, uh, increasing mortality and prevalence uh, and, uh, as a decreasing as a, as, a, as a trend and try to, to decrease. So reverse the increasing into decreasing and then also update the health statistics. So statistics so we can really have the real situation, what we have on the terrain and where to go and how to fight with that. And next slide please. And so new improvements are needed to make pub tests like screening affordable, accessible, infrastructure independent and equitable for developing countries. Uh, there is an international congress now of cytology which will be held in Paris and I'm part of a group who works on the bringing of, of prevention of cervical cancer screening to, to developing world and there will be a lecture in Paris on the 28th uh, evaluation of cytology screening strategies for cervical cancer in resource poor settings with recommendations. And I'm, I was invited to participate in this group. And the last, uh, we wrote with Professor Dr. Nenad Markovic, we wrote the book in 2008, What Every Woman Should Know About Cervical Cancer. Springer published the book and it is available on Amazon. You can just just type uh, my name in the in the in the in the window, and and the book the book pop up. And you can read the book electronically, also on the internet for free. And the second edition of the book was published in by Springer in in December 2010, and updated and extended edition is expected to, to be available. We are writing on this about 400 pages in, in 2014. And if you like to know more and to read more, you can go to our websites there. And I would like to, to finish my presentation with the same words how I started, that no effort is too big, no investment too large, to save one human life. And this is what we are doing. Thank you.